Well, hello, Facebook land. This is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70, and welcome to a special Election Day edition of Studio C70. We're uh, delighted to be uh, uh, in conversation today with uh, Jim Gerlach. Uh, Jim is currently President and CEO of the Greater, Greater Reading Chamber Alliance, but has a long uh, and uh, important uh, legacy as a public servant, as a state legislator, as a member of Congress, and as a an all-around community leader. So it's great to have you with us today, Jim. Thanks, David. Great to be with you. Thank you. So we're here to talk about a passion project, I'll call it of Jim's, which is uh, the, the need to, uh, uh, and, and the value of teaching civics uh, to young people, uh, to uh, give them the, the background to be contributing citizens. And I wanted to start out with a little personal reflection. Jim, if you could tell us uh, what you recall about the first time you voted uh, as a voter and, and also uh, maybe a reflection on some formative experience you might have had in school uh, where the value of learning about this country and our great democracy sort of became apparent to you. Yep, absolutely. Well, uh, you're making me date, our, date myself and maybe you as well. When I first voted, the voting age was 21, not 18. And so I was in college at the time and it was in 1976. And it was a very important uh, political time and, and political era. And so I was excited about an opportunity to, you know, let my voice be heard through the, uh, uh, through the voting process and was excited about it. Uh, my mother, uh, I grew up uh, in Western Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Pittsburgh. And my mother was a uh, school board member uh, for a number of years during that time period. And so <clears throat> that's when I got a little more um, of an idea of how important it is to be involved in, in public matters, to have your voice heard as a voter, to speak up uh, relative to public policies that are affecting you and your family and your community. Uh, it was really through my mom's uh, work as a public servant, as a school board member. And that's one of, that's one of the toughest jobs in, in elective office that there is. Uh, you know, there's the glitz and glamour perhaps of higher office, but the people that work on school boards and are elected to school boards do a tremendous service to their communities by doing that work. And mom was one of those. She believed strongly in public service and, uh, and uh, really instilled that in us as kids. And so when I had an opportunity to vote in 1976, I was raring to go and uh, cast my first ballot. And I don't think I've missed a, a primary or general since then. I might have been sick one of those days, but I'll well, bet we're you. We're not going to go check. We're not going to. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet not... you. I'll bet you if I missed any, it was just maybe one. Otherwise, I've voted every time since then. Well, you point out, uh, I think, an important principle is maybe the best way to learn civics is uh, at the at the kitchen table, the dining room table, talking with your family about their role in in leading their community and and serving in the uh, in, on a school board or local elected office. So fast forward, you have a, had a long career as a uh, as a legislator, both at the state level and the congressional level. What along the way in your experience in talking with constituents sort of made you think that we, that citizens were not uh, having the benefit of a, of a rich and deep civics education? What, were there sort of light bulbs that went off along the way that, that made you think we, we need to do something better here? Well, I think, I think more than anything, uh, in my 12 years in the state legislature and 12 years in Congress, what I was constantly struck by time and time and time again, when I would be out in the district and I'd be talking to my constituents, how so many of them felt as if their voice really wasn't being heard, that politicians were those that just got elected because somebody gave them a lot of money uh, to pay for them to be elected. And therefore, once they were elected, they just did whatever they uh, did vote wise based on who gave them the most money. And what I kept trying to emphasize when I would do my town hall meetings and have other interactions with my constituents is the power they have as citizens. They, if they get active, if they get involved, if they get knowledgeable about public policy issues, they can have a really big impact on how an elected official acts, how an elected official thinks about that issue, what the elected official does, maybe in a committee vote or a vote on the floor or in some other action, that citizens have tremendous power if they use it and use it collectively. 
So I kept trying to emphasize that, and I still believe it to this day, that uh, citizens have a tremendous power if they would just know they have it and would exercise it in terms of speaking up in the process, either in between elections as, as an advocate or at election time with, uh, with their votes. And yeah. my first vote, or my first election, I should say, that I got elected to the State House in 1990, I won by 23 votes out of 17,000 votes cast. It was less than one vote per precinct. There were 33 polling places in uh, the 155th district in 1990. And uh, when you win by uh, 23 votes, that's less than one vote per precinct. So had one vote change in each precinct, I would have lost by 10 rather than one by 23. So Absolutely. that emphasized to me all the more and underscored all the more, again, the importance of people participating in the process. Yeah. My former colleague, and I suspect someone you know, uh, Karen Miller, former mayor of Reading a while back, uh, said to me once that when a, a public official says to you, uh, that he or she has heard from a number of people, sometimes that number can be quite small, as in one. So mm -hmm. another uh, illustration that that uh, every voice matters and all the more reason to to get involved in the um, in the process. So now let's turn to sort of the the meat of the order and talk about this PA Civics initiative, which which you, uh, and I'll give you a chance to describe what PA Civics is all about, but it's an it's a an issue and a theme that you and a number of other former members of Congress in Pennsylvania ha have championed, I suspect for some of the same reasons you just shared with us. But tell folks a little bit more about PA Civics. Yeah, and by the way, thank you, uh, David and, and Lauren, there at the Committee 70 for your participation and what we're trying to do. Uh, when I got out of Congress in January of 2015, a little bit later that spring, uh, the former members of Congress Association, which is a, uh, as it, the name tells you, is a, an association of former members, decided to make civics education a prominent initiative for the organization. So they asked former members to look at ways in their particular states that, that they reside, uh, how they can try to promote civics education. So at that point in time, uh, having been also a, uh, an education minor when I was in college, I thought, uh, well, there's a lot that can be done in Pennsylvania. And uh, as a result, I reached out to some of my former colleagues. And about that same time, you might remember, the legislature passed into law and Governor Wolf signed into law Act 35, which mandates a civics education test uh, in grades eight through 12, uh, starting this past school year. So when we first started formulating uh, this effort, uh, we wanted to get important players from around the state that deal with civics education on a day-to-day -day basis, including your committee, uh, National Constitution Center, the Rendell Center, uh, Heinz History Center, et cetera, and see if there is an interest in trying to join forces to try to figure out how we can work together collectively to promote civics education. And one of the first initiatives was, how do we help with Act 35? How do we help educators get the resources they need to, to teach civics in the right way at the right grade level over time? Uh, and what else can we do to promote it among the general populace uh, overall? And so with COVID, we've, as you know, have struggled somewhat in terms of just getting traction on the Act 35 front only because our schools and school districts have not been able to really put the full uh, shoulder into the effort because of just having to deal with COVID uh, during the past school year. But now I think uh, schools are a little bit more normal. And so Act 35 continues. We wanna to try to see where we can, again, support teachers with their teacher development, with their resources, as well as expand beyond that to maybe schools of higher education in Pennsylvania, as well as just uh, community organizations generally across the state. How can we talk about our constitution, our declaration of independent, independence, our institutions, and what all of that means relative to today's citizenry and what their power continues to be and what their duty continues to be. Because we, I've always felt for every right that you have, you have a responsibility and we have wonderful uh, civic rights, civil rights through our constitution, but there's also responsibilities then as citizens. So how do we promote an understanding of those rights, but also the understanding and action around those responsibilities. So it's a good group and I think we can uh, really move forward this year with some more efforts and, and build on what we started just uh, in the past uh, two years. And, and I'll point out, uh, it's a bipartisan group. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, you, uh, former member Joe Huffle from this area, Phil English, former Republican member from uh, Erie, uh, Melissa Hart, uh, also from Western Pennsylvania, Bob Brady. Um, so you've got Mark, a good- Mark Kritz, uh, Democrat from uh, Western Pennsylvania, the Johnstown, Altoona area. So it's a good bipartisan group. Uh, everybody's doing it for the right reason. And uh, just how can we lend our support as former members? Because of course we've been involved in the day-to-day -day governmental type work, uh, legislative work in particular, uh, that has brought its own lessons and allows us to, to be educational, I think. But, but there's other groups and there's other individuals that can be helpful too. We wanna to bring all that together and coordinate it and make that available to, uh, uh, to those across the state that wanna really move civics education forward. Great. In the meantime, let's acknowledge that maybe a few years ago, the teaching civics, better civics in Pennsylvania uh, had a broad appeal. Uh, there were Democrats, Republicans, conservative liberals who maybe all agreed that it's, uh, it'd be helpful to uh, raise the level of knowledge, awareness, participation, so forth among citizens. But like a lot of other aspects of our public life, um, that issue has become very politicized the last couple of years. And there's a lot more focus on, I'll call it the content that is taught in, uh, in civics education. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and that is showing up even today in, in school board races uh, around the Commonwealth and around the country where uh, school board members are uh, attacking one another about what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. Uh, so I'm just interested in, in your thoughts on how to sort of thread the needle. Needle. If you were, you know, I started my career as a social studies teacher way back when. So if I were to put you in that role today and I said, Jim, I want you want to make sure that your students have a good grasp of the, the fundamentals of sort of civic knowledge but I can't let you get too ideological. <laughs> so how would you thread the needle or, or, or what advice or thoughts do you yeah. have? About I, I guess to use a, use a sports analogy, to me, it would be like, uh, uh, you know, that first week of summer football camp and you get the players all into camp, you're not there teaching them necessarily, uh, you know, uh, why, you know, their school has this mascot or why their school was 0 and 10 last year versus 10 and 1. All you're trying to do is teach them the fundamentals, how to block, how to tackle, how to, uh, how to catch, how to uh, hold the ball when you're coming through the line as a running back. You're teaching the fundamentals. And I think that's what our social studies educators should be doing, teaching them the fundamentals of our structure of government, how our government operates, uh, why it operates the way it does on occasion could be uh, could be the legislative branch is doing something could be a decision by the judicial branch could be action taken by uh, by a president or by a governor uh, or by county commissioners on the executive side. So what are the fundamentals of our system of government and what's the role of those citizens uh, uh, relative to that government. Um, and, you know, I've always thought and I and I always forget to the name of this ancient philosopher, but the, but his saying is so apropos, um, uh, great citizens are not born, they're made. And I think that's absolutely true. I think, I think uh, everybody needs to, through their educational experience, needs to be given uh, an understanding of what their role is as an individual in their community, uh, in their society, and what they can do to impact positively what's what's going on in that community and what's going on in that society. So it's teaching them that fu those fundamentals. Now what they do with it, everybody's different in their philosophy and their ideology. And so ultimately some may go off and push public policy issues in one direction that some people don't like versus another direction. But as long as they're doing it civilly and they're engaging appropriately with their fellow citizens, that's all great. And ultimately it'll all come out in, the, in, in a positive way if they then engage in the process the way it should be. And uh, so again, back to your question, as a social studies teacher formerly, I think it's, it's teaching our students and even citizens that have left school a long time ago, just the fundamentals of what our, our, our structure of government is, what their role is as citizens, and the recognition that for all the rights that they have, and of course, many people you know, wanna stand up and claim the rights that they have, but they also have responsibilities. And that, 
includes uh, acting civilly when in public, obeying the law, treating fellow citizens with respect, voting every election cycle. There's certain fundamental responsibilities of citizens that are just as important as to what you do uh, when you are a citizen. So that's what, that's what I would try to teach in a, in a classroom if I had the opportunity. Wonderful. And what would you describe in your head, you know, five years down the road, what, what's, what does success look like for PA Civics? What, what, what do you think we should be trying to accomplish? We've got 10 organizations now that are partners. I'd like to see that doubled uh, with great uh, 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 civic organizations that believe in what we're trying to accomplish. We would have a really great resource and content library for educators all across the state to draw down on uh, when they want to as they're teaching their courses at their grade level. We'd have very active uh, both in-person and virtual rep webinars with not only former members, leaders like yourself engaged in the community talking about important issues in those communities and in those counties across Pennsylvania. And again, reinforcing rights and responsibilities and how you engage as a citizen to achieve uh, what you believe is necessary. So if we had a very robust uh, uh, community outreach program, a robust resource and content library that was being used by our educators at the uh, elementary, secondary, and even higher education levels, uh, and we grew our partnership out to uh, maybe double what it is today, I think that would be pretty good success. Great. Well, I'll just say on behalf of uh, not only the Committee of 70, but of uh, everybody who's listening, uh, 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 or watching and, and all the partners I really appreciate your taking the lead on this issue. And it feels like, you know, the history of America is when times are uh, at their most challenging, uh, that's also a time uh, of great opportunity for something like this is to remind ourselves uh, where we come from uh, and the responsibilities we have as citizens and, and that this is our future to shape. So uh, well thank said. you for Thank you for carrying that message. And um, I know you have an important duty to fulfill uh, coming up uh, later today, which is to go vote yourself. So I don't want to keep you from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to keep the ball rolling here, keep my uh, whatever consecutive uh, election it is. I want to keep it going. Great. So, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Jim. Thanks for having me, David. Appreciate okay. it. Thank yep, you. Bye.